Working from home has caused an array of new problems for municipal IT departments who are balancing adapting to the new normal and keeping their systems secure. But IT security is a field that was already seeing drastic changes before the pandemic. We'll talk about this and more on the Municipal Voice this week with guests Henry Dashowitz and Karen Del Vecchio of the City of Norwalk, as well as Dale Brockhart, VP of Marketing for Digital Back Office. We'd like to thank our premier sponsors at Digital Back Office Palo Alto Networks. Check them out at digitalbackoffice.com or paloaltonetworks.com, as well as our sponsors at Gateway and Houstonic Community Colleges. The Municipal Voice is the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities podcast in collaboration with WNTH LP 103.5 FM. I'm your host, Matt Ford. As always, be sure to give us a like and let us know what you're thinking in the comments. CCM's Municipal Voice podcast continues to present a key forum on important state local issues. The views expressed do not necessarily reflect the consensus views of CCM or our member municipal leaders. Hey everyone, thanks for being here today. Thank you, good morning. Good morning. Could we uh, talk about your roles in uh, in Norwalk and in the security there? And how, because you're in different departments and, and some of you aren't even in City Hall, how do your cross paths between that? Uh, can we start with Henry? Thank you. Uh, I'm Henry Dakwitz. I'm the Chief Financial Officer of Norwalk, and uh, I am responsible for accounting, budgeting, and IT, among other duties. Um, so I have more of an executive role. Mm-hmm. Um, I rely heavily on my Chief Information Officer, Karen Del Vecchio who has wealth of experience, 18 years in Norwalk itself. And slowly but surely, she's dragged me along to over six conferences on cybersecurity, as well as I can now use 12 buzzwords in the industry. Um, So I have a strategic role and I interact at the cabinet level uh, within the city and also with our board of education regarding computers, networks, and cybersecurity. So you may not have expected it originally, but you've become a reluctant expert in IT and, and security now? Well, I was a user. Now I'm going to say I'm a very limited player slash coach. More on the coach, less of a player. All right. Uh, Karen, what do, you, what do you do? So as Henry mentioned, um, my, my title is Director of Information Technology for the City of Norwalk. Um, I have a small staff of about 10 people um, who do amazing work. Uh, We're responsible for all of the city IT function, including public safety and the libraries and the health department. Mm -hmm. Um, We support the infrastructure uh, applications, probably close to 100 different applications at this point, um, as well as desktop support and security. All right. And Dale, you do not work for the city of Norwalk, but you do work with them. Could you tell us what you do? Yes, I'm, I'm the uh, Vice President for Marketing and uh, Public Sector Sales for Digital Back Office. And uh, uh, the City of Norwalk has been uh, a, a customer of ours since uh, 2005, I believe, 2004, 2005. And uh, uh, we have uh, what I call a, a great partnership with the city. Uh, and we have worked with Karen uh, all those years. Uh, and uh, we're, uh, we're, I'm pleased that uh, uh, they have taken cybersecurity as seriously as they should uh, mm-hmm. and as many other municipalities should. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to hearing more about uh, uh, the steps they're taking to make sure the city is secure. So I guess there has been a theme, especially this year, uh, with the changing role of IT administration in municipal government. Uh, as well as the importance of cybersecurity, um, especially true now because of uh, what people working from home, because of the pandemic. How has that worked out for you in Norwalk and what, what have you run into so far? Well, um, when I first joined, um, I was sensitive to cybersecurity and we retained an outside consulting firm, Bloom Shapiro, to do mm-hmm. a cybersecurity assessment of the entire city. So they looked at the city side, the Board of Education. They also looked at our um, Water and Pollution Control Authority. And we just wanted an assessment. How are we doing? Where are we vulnerable? Um, I was gratified to see that we were doing pretty well. But obviously, there was room for improvement. And we tightened up and made those uh, implementations. Mm -hmm. Um, Additionally, as I mentioned, I've been to cybersecurity conferences. And what I notice is, 
as opposed to accounting or some other areas, you don't just learn a body of knowledge and you're done. Yeah. Um, it's ever evolving. Um, it's more like uh, spy versus spy in the old mad magazine. As soon as you solve one problem, they come up with other issues. Yeah. So I categorize it into three areas, uh, people, processes, and the technology. Mm -hmm. You need the systems and the software. Some of it is what we do. Some of it is where vendors like digital back office help us. Mm -hmm. um, but what Karen and I focus on more are the people and the processes and procedures. So mm -hmm. we have dual factor authorization. Um, we work with a company that tests with phony phishing attempts to try to identify how different uh, employees might be susceptible to that and then give them additional training. I believe I saw that 90% of cyber breaches are done through social engineering and people. Mm -hmm. So it's an ever evolving policy. And we can talk about chief information security officer. That was a very uh, important factor recommended by Bloom. And mm -hmm. at the same time mentioned at all the security conferences. And that's why we're moving in that direction. All right, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, Dale, so he mentioned uh, doing initial assessment. Do you think that's kind of an important first step for anyone that's looking to up their cybersecurity games, kind of figure out where they're at at the present before they kind of launch something new? Yes, we actually uh, uh, perform a, a free service called a security lifecycle review. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is really intended to draw attention particularly to whether it's a, a municipal administration or a school systems a board of ed, draw attention to the types of attacks that are occurring daily, mm -hmm. hourly. Uh, and uh, it's important that uh, the municipalities uh, and public sector understand that this is just a, a, an ongoing challenge that needs to be addressed. and. Uh, as Henry said, uh, they, uh, they need to take it to the highest levels of the organization, whether that's at the board level or a city council level, and it needs to be a part of, uh, of every, uh, almost, I would recommend it be a part of every meeting, every discussion, uh, because it is so, so important. Fundamental to everything. Uh, Karen, uh, just back to you for a second. How has kind of your role changed in the last year? Well, COVID-19 certainly has changed the way that, that we do business. Um, it has really changed how we envision delivering services. It's no longer a case of the expectation is the resident or the business owner comes to City Hall to engage in some type of transaction. Um, pushing our employees to work from home really was a, a, a paradigm shift, I think, in government. Um, mm -hmm. No one has ever heard of the term government from home before. Um, it's work from home, but not necessarily government from home. So this was really a gigantic change for, for everyone. And it presents for IT some unique challenges mm -hmm. in that now the workforce is is remote and yeah. do you have the infrastructure in place and the privacy and security infrastructure to go with that in place um, to protect the information that's getting passed back and forth now between a remote worker and um, wherever your cloud-based applications or servers happen to be and have you trained your workforce to be able to recognize when they're working from home what different types of um, security or malware mm -hmm. or phishing attempts um, they could be faced with. I mean, with COVID-19, we've seen all kinds of phishing attempts that look very real, that look um, very official, um, but in reality, they're not. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that has been really a, a huge challenge, I think, for every IT department, whether you're in the private sector or in the public sector, but especially for the public sector. Primarily, our folks work in City Hall or they work mm -hmm. at the police department or they work at the library. They're not, they're not work from home workers. And that has been a, an enormous change. The training, yeah. the infrastructure, the security, uh, multi-layered approach that has to take place. Um, how many individuals were we talking about roughly that you needed to set up to work from home rather quickly? Oh, it was hundreds. Hundreds, okay. So hundreds. It's always a big task. 
it was a big task with very little notice. So the decision was made and I think there was, you know, 72 hours of, okay, this is what we're going to do in response to COVID-19. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, at the time, we, no one really had an estimate of how long this was going to take place. Is this, do you activate your two week hurricane plan where your offices are closed for a week or two weeks? Mm-hmm. Um, that's pretty much what we were going from. No yeah. one imagined that seven months later, we would still have most of our workforce working remotely. Yeah, I thought it'd be out for a couple of weeks tops. Exactly. I, um, I would add if I could, mm-hmm. um, when COVID hit and we had to work from home, The primary focus of everyone was how do we get up and running? How do Mm -hmm. we do this? How do we mobilize? Cybersecurity is an afterthought. It's not an afterthought to Karen and me, but it's an afterthought to getting up and running. Mm -hmm. So there's a vulnerability in trying to get people's awareness when their whole work life is changing is, is hard just to get them their attention and to focus on the issue. I think that's very true. Um, So we kind of all know that the dangers of uh, being in groups and possibly being exposed to COVID right now, but what are some of the dangers uh, out there when it comes to working remotely um, as far as security and stuff? I know like we have to sign in to a VPN and you mentioned that you're using uh, two-factor authentication. Um, Why is is two-factor important? Um, Why why is it important? Let's, Let's start with you. Well, two-factor has actually been around for a number of years, mm-hmm. uh, and it's probably the most cost-effective way to ensure that the person that's trying to log into a specific application, whether that's your your email or a financial system uh, or a human resources system, uh, it's really the most cost-effective way to ensure that uh, that the person that's trying to log in is, in fact, you. Mm-hmm. Uh, by simply uh, using a, a simple response uh, from your from your uh, uh, smartphone, mm-hmm. uh, so it, it uh, I think it's pretty widely used. I think you've been using it in uh, Norwalk for some time, though, haven't you, Karen? We have. We we started it initially with uh, public safety, and then we moved it to um, all of our employee self service applications. Yeah. Um, for the people at home who might not be in a job where they have to do this yet. What, what is two-factor authentication? Just briefly, how does that work? So two-factor authentication really is, is something I have and something I know. Um, if you think of your ATM, uh, your mm-hmm. ATM card, um, you have an ATM card, which is something mm-hmm. you have, and you have a PIN, which is something you know. And without those two authentication pieces, mm-hmm. you are not able to withdraw money from the ATM from your account. So two the factor- card and the PIN are one, two, two-factor. Correct. Something yeah. I have and something I know. Um, and, and really, that's a, a very simple uh, explanation of two-factor authentication. So in some implementations, it's I have a, a badge and a PIN code. Um, in some cases, it's I have a, a, a FOB, a key FOB, and I have a, a password. In some instances, correct, I have a password and then a code is sent to uh, my uh, primary, uh, either uh, secondary email or secondary cell phone number um, mm-hmm. that gives me an authorization code, which is a short-lived authorization code in order to access that particular application or information. So there's a lot of different ways to do it, but the, the basic theme is, is that something you have and something you know. Correct. Um, a question for, I guess, all of you um, is one of the more worrisome kinds of attacks is the ransomware attack. Um, maybe start with Karen. Uh, can you describe what a ransomware attack is and why that might be a di- disaster financially for the city? Certainly. So in, in basic terms, a ransomware attack is um, a bad actor uh, will ha- gain unauthorized access to your data um, and they will encrypt that data um, and hold it for ransom. Mm-hmm. Um, they'll notify you that they've done this or you will figure it out once once you can't operate any any longer yeah. um, and will ask for money in, in order in exchange for the code to decrypt the information. Mm-hmm. In some cases, um, when you pay, 
typically in, in Bitcoin. Uh, when you pay, they will give you a code and you can then decrypt your information. Yeah. Um, you can not pay and go back to what you hope and pray are very good backups so that you mm -hmm. can restore that data. Um, in some cases, um, the if you don't pay, which we've seen recently, is the, um, the bad actor will then disclose that information uh, to the mm -hmm. web. There's not even just the loss of, of information. It could be disclosing people's private information that you could be worried about. That is correct, yes. Um, I guess this one probably is good for Henry. Um, thinking about the attacks where they chose not to pay the ransom but ended up paying more later to recover their data after the hackers kind of did their thing. Uh, what, what do you see as the right thing to do? Do you pay and essentially incentivize attacks on other places or do you not pay and risk the cost of restoring your network from scratch or people's data getting out there? Well, I, I think, um when all of us react emotionally initially with this kind of attack, it's, we don't pay ransom, mm -hmm. it encourages bad behavior. However, I recognize logically that um, it may be wise and appropriate in certain situations to pay a ransom. Um, I, I look at our defenses on three levels. It's um, people, technology, and financial. So we've talked a little bit about the technology. Uh, Karen and Dale and all of our staff and vendors are working on the technology side. On, on the people side, we're working against that social engineering and we rely on outside vendors. Financially, mm -hmm. we make sure that our budgets are robust mm -hmm. and that both um, on the operating budget, the capital budget, um, there are sufficient resources to mm -hmm. do what we have to do but the last piece is insurance and okay. making sure that God forbid there is a breach that we have someone standing behind us, but it's mm -hmm. not just financial. Uh, the proper insurance policy offers what I call the, the, the hotline mm -hmm. where they help guide you through the process when there is a breach. Mm -hmm. Step one might be to engage a lawyer so that at all subsequent discussions have attorney client privilege. Mm -hmm. Then we may be in contact with some tech experts who can determine how the breach occurred, whether they're still in there, kick them out, mm -hmm. and how you close the door. The next step might be, what are our vulnerabilities? Do we mm -hmm. have to disclose, et cetera? Advice on whether to pay a ransom or not. Mm -hmm. So it's operational as well as financial, and we, we try to be ever vigilant. Yeah. Hey, Dale, so God forbid something happens and someone does have a breach. What, what would you guys do if you were coming into that situation with someone that has already had a breach? How would you check out just their system and going forward, what would you do with them? Well, we would certainly, uh, first of all, advocate that uh, the municipality or the school would take steps before a breach occurred to uh, lower what we call the attack surface. The attack surface mm -hmm. is uh, any, any way that somebody can breach your system, whether that's through a home computer, whether that's through a, a phishing attack, whether that's through uh, some sort of access to uh, your internal systems by bringing in uh, 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 some sort of media, inserting it on your network and loading some sort of ransomware code on your network that then explodes sometimes months later. Uh, so we would certainly advocate taking those steps. And, and I think in Karen's case and in the case of Norwalk, they have taken those steps over the past several years to harden their systems, to, to, to lower their attack surface. Uh, after somebody's been attacked, we have oftentimes been called in to uh, put the adequate protections on the endpoint devices, uh, upgrade the uh, perimeter uh, firewalls. Um, but uh, we don't get into the, uh, our company doesn't get into the sort of forensics that, uh, that Henry was talking about. Uh, mm -hmm. Leave that to, to others. To specialists. Uh, but uh, we, we would certainly advocate trying to take those steps before the ransomware attacks occur mm -hmm. so that you don't have to deal with the, the back end of the problem. 
So pre prevention is, is really where you guys focus on and where you come in. You are listening to the Municipal Voice on WNHH 103.5 FM. Now, in response to some of these threats, and you mentioned this a little bit before, Henry, uh, the city has taken a step, has become kind of more common, and you're looking for a Chief Information Security Offer, CISO. Um, why hire a CISO and, you know, has information security really become like a full-time position like that in uh, town government, city government? A absolutely. I, I mean, when I think of uh, Karen and her limited team mm -hmm. and also the Board of Ed, they're responsible for, I don't know, 48 different things at any time. Uh, is the network up and running? How are we going to get people working remotely? Um, is this software upgrade going? Um, mm. All these changes and cybersecurity isn't always number one on their plate. Yeah. When you hire a CISO, it's number one on their plate, but it's even mm -hmm. broader than that. What I've learned is that it's not just cybersecurity, it's more privacy, information privacy. Now, mm -hmm. as a municipality, we have very sensitive information. We have tax records, which has everyone's personal information. We mm -hmm. have a health department that has medical records covered by HIPAA. We have school children in the school system and we have sensitive information there. We have law enforcement data that's critical with tremendous video archives because of all the body cameras. So mm -hmm. we are in charge of a lot of information. And as Dale was mentioning before with ransomware, it may not be only paying to get access but what if they divulge sensitive information? We've mm -hmm. had these retailers who had millions of data items that were revealed and they mm -hmm. have to pay for security for several years. They have to disclose there might be regulatory violations. Mm -hmm. So the CISO's role is to be number one on cybersecurity, coordinating with our CIOs on the city and the board mm -hmm. of ed side. But at the same time, if we accept a credit card for payment, and mm -hmm. the clerk writes down the credit card number on a piece of paper. If that's not shredded and disposed of carefully, we yeah. could be vulnerable. So the CISO's role is broadly defined as information security, mm -hmm. with a, you know, and 1A is cybersecurity. So it sounds like it's not just for them being concerned about hackers coming from the outside, which is a big concern, but also how people internally in City Hall handle and manage that data in a secure way that protects people's privacy. And let, let's just add uh, the nightmare where firms have been hacked on the inside with rogue employees mm -hmm. who have downloaded terabytes of information and disclosed mm -hmm. them. So now uh, when we hire even a temporary employee, we screen them. Mm -hmm. So you have to look, I'll go back to Dale's point of attack surface. You mm -hmm. want to harden it and you want to minimize it. And some of it is procedures. They seem mundane. They seem mm -hmm. to be painful. You're, yeah. You know, I have to go through this process. I need this person today. Sorry, that vulnerability is too important to us. So we try to put it in every day. As Dale said, prevention is worth about a thousand times rather than a cure afterwards. Um. So I, I've read in some articles that CISOs have to manage risks by adapting to the times. Uh, right now, employees are adapting themselves and using programs downloaded from the internet, uh, using their personal devices, cloud services, all these kind of new things that they're trying to scramble to figure out how to do their jobs remotely. But they haven't been vetted, um, which could be a nightmare for security. Um, how do you mitigate these possible avenues of exposure? Uh, Karen, let's start with you. You need to put really good controls in place for this and need to educate your employees. Mm -hmm. um, they need to have a clear understanding of what's acceptable and what is unacceptable mm -hmm. um, beh behaviors, including downloading applications um, or, or taking uh, or using, you know, freeware that they might find on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, we make it a point to outfit all of our employees with city issued equipment. Yes, it's mm -hmm. more expensive, um, but we can control that, that piece of equipment, that endpoint, a lot better at that mm -hmm. point. Um, and then again, it gets back to employee training, um, helping raise the awareness level with every employee from 
from top to bottom, if you will, mm -hmm. on the importance of cybersecurity. Um, and again, this is the CISO plays such a huge role in this too. You know, we envision this position as a, me a member of the mayor's cabinet um, mm -hmm. to advise chief and senior staff. Um, let's get the consistent message out at the very highest levels um, to bring it down to the organization, um, as well as with our elected officials. Mm -hmm. Um, on the importance of internal security and privacy, as well as what some of those emerging risks and threats are from both internal and external sources. Um, we view this as a position that will work with the senior leaders uh, to integrate security into their operations um, and make sure that we're in compliance with our own policies as well as um, applicable laws. So holistically, we view this as it will position us to where we have fewer security breaches, which means mm -hmm. reduce financial loss and minimizing the impact on operations. Yes, everybody wants to get the job done, but it has to be done within the confines of what our policies are and what our training is. And again, this is the CISO's sole function is to bring that dedicated role for privacy um, and information security, wherever that information exists and in whatever format that information mm -hmm. exists, to the organization from the cabinet level all the way down to the frontline employee. Um, so kind of related to this, uh, right now we're talking to each other on Zoom. Um, and so kind of another area where the popularity of this platform has kind of outshined some early reports of Zoom bombing was kind of, at the very beginning of this was an was a issue that everyone was talking about. Um, how do you square the safety with kind of the utility? Um, Henry? Um, it's a trade-off and you have to go and, and battle. I know, um, what Karen has implemented for Zoom is that um, the codes are only issued to the people who are participating. It becomes mm -hmm. a little bit more of a challenge when you have a public meeting. Mm -hmm. but we have ways to control that as well. The moderator can cut people off right away. Mm -hmm. So we try to limit that. Um, another area that has been increasing in frequency has been breaches through third party vendors. Okay. So we may have great security but we have vendors who have access to our networks and we have implemented a process to vet the computer security of our vendors. Mm -hmm. And then it starts all the way with the RFP process where they have to fill out a questionnaire and Karen reviews it and we sort of give it a red, yellow or green. Green says great certifications, you could get everything. Mm -hmm. Yellow says maybe we are a little bit more cautious and monitor mm -hmm. you more carefully when you have access. And Red says, we cannot do business and access uh, and the vendor access our system because mm -hmm. we're just concerned about security. So we try to respond. It's a trade-off. It's mm -hmm. a hassle, but we'd rather pay the little bit of, um, you know, cost up front rather yeah. than the damage that could happen on the back end. Yeah. Uh, Dale, Henry was talking about vetting vendors. You're, you're a vendor. Um, how do you kind of deal with your own internal security um, in regards to working with municipalities? How do, you, how do you make sure that you would get a good clean rating? One of the challenges that I think uh, a lot of municipalities and, and schools in the private sector face is uh, their reliance on legacy uh, uh, products, mm -hmm. legacy products such as the antivirus software, uh, firewalls, legacy products are, are products oftentimes that are, uh, they're five years, 10 years, 10 plus years old, mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, they were good products when they were designed, Yeah. but the attack surface has changed in the mm -hmm. past several years. The, uh, the, the type of hacking is taking place today is much different than it was five, mm -hmm. 10 years ago. And in order to, uh, to again, uh, kind of minimize that attack surface requires an investment in uh, in that infrastructure, uh, upgrades of uh, of newer uh, next generation firewalls, uh, mm -hmm. upgrades of uh, new ways of protecting the endpoint, new ways of using two factor authentication. Mm -hmm. So uh, those are are, are uh, oft times uh, financial decisions. Mm -hmm. And the IT department has to make that case oftentimes to their administrators or their boards uh, as to why they should uh, make this investment. Mm -hmm. 
like how often do you think they should be? You said five years is legacy. Like what is kind of the shelf life on some of these things? Uh, well, Karen probably has more real world experience, but we yeah. typically see when it, when it comes to hardware, uh, five to seven years is, mm -hmm. uh, is probably the shelf life. Uh, yeah. Most hardware products like firewalls are end of life after uh, by the vendors after uh, five or six or seven years. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, again, you know the the uh, the, uh, the cybersecurity environment has changed so uh, uh, drastically in the past several years mm -hmm. that uh, it really requires a, a constant, uh, uh, almost uh, uh, annual investment in uh, in security. In upgrading. Um, so aside from COVID, what are some other big changes um, happening in Norwalk now when it comes to IT? So when it comes to IT, um, you know, from a cybersecurity perspective, um, what we've learned is you really need a comprehensive information security strategy. Um, mm -hmm. To Dale's point, it's not just about a firewall. It's not just about having technology. And to Henry's point, it's about people, it's about process, and it's about technology. Um, and if you, of those three pieces, if you get one of them wrong, mm -hmm. then you're, you do not have a comprehensive inform information security strategy mm -hmm. that's going to be successful. Um, and you need to make the investment in the people and in the process changes and in the technology to make it all work. Mm -hmm. um, that's what we've learned from our experience um, and, you know, working with our vendor partners uh, and even from uh, what our own people have, have brought it to the table. Mm -hmm. um, and we really need to see that CISO is bringing that comprehensive information security strategy to life mm -hmm. uh, and to having it as an integral part of our organization. I always say that cybersecurity is a team sport. Mm -hmm. um, it involves every person. It's not just IT's problem. It's, it's not just IT's responsibility. It's mm -hmm. everyone's responsibility. Um, and that's where that, that strategy really is important. Yeah. Um, and then having that senior executive champion uh, to really bring this through the organization, um, mm -hmm. uh, advising the mayor, advising the common council, advising the, the superintendent of schools, and then having a budget. Um, whether that's capital or operating in order to bring about those changes to implement that strategy. Yeah. Um, and it really, it's a multi-layer approach, the training for our employees, the right tools in their hands, the right software for mm -hmm. them to do their jobs uh, operationally, uh, the right processes in place. And again, having those third party independent assessments, they not mm -hmm. only look at your technology, but they look at your processes. How yeah. are you doing this? What are you doing? And how can we integrate information security into those, 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 how we handle those credit card pieces of paper that should mm -hmm. be shredded, if you will, to, to Henry's early example. And then also what technology recommendations uh, can be made to support operationally how we work, where people are working, um, and how we can do it in the most secure possible way. Mm -hmm. um, it's striking a balance. Uh, Henry also mentioned that too. Um, there are trade-offs that are involved. Um, but if we've learned one thing is it's having that comprehensive strategy um, and, and just bringing that to every part of the organization. Yeah. Um, were there? Yeah, I had please. one point. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Karen has been in Norwalk for 18 years. She has great relationships with all the departments, um, but in government, as well as some corporations I'm familiar with, they have a silo mentality and some departments don't play mm -hmm. nicely with others. They don't collaborate well. Um, I think we're doing fine on the city side, but the city and the board of ed are pretty independent. So mm -hmm. it's really important to cross those borders because as Karen would say, the bad guys don't care. Yeah. Uh, they'll find the weakest link. And that's why when we did our cybersecurity review, we mandated that they look at the entire city from an outsider point of view. Mm -hmm. We don't care where the vulnerabilities are, we have to patch them up. Yeah. And I think that's part of the internal challenge. I'm at the cabinet level and I'm able to have those discussions. I'm looking forward to an ally in the CISO to mm. also add the input and doing it across the whole city board of ed and our other outside authorities. Yeah. It sounds like it's going to be an important role when you find that person. Um, 
Were there any goals that you had in mind for Norwalk for 2020 that had to stop, be called off because of COVID? Or are there any that might have actually been sped up by it? I, I will be honest. Um, we have certain projects to upgrade and to improve in certain areas. Mm -hmm. But because of the additional responsibilities that the IT department had because of mm -hmm. COVID um, and with the limitation of just resources and manpower, yeah. um, we deferred a couple of projects to next year. Mm -hmm. And was there anything that got bumped up? I, I think all the work from home um, mm -hmm. activity. We bought a ton of laptops. We had to make sure there were hot spots available for people. Mm -hmm. So um, Karen can talk about more of the details, but anything relating to work at home and of course the security related to that got a higher priority. Yeah, were you kind of already um, going towards some of that be before this happened? Like the ability for employees to work from home, was that kind of already part of the plan? Yes, um, it, it, over the past few years, we've taken uh, more of an approach of moving applications to the cloud as opposed mm -hmm. to having them on premise. And some of those decisions that we made in the last 12 or 18 months before COVID have really paid off mm. by moving those applications to the cloud. So it just accelerated some of the existing plans. Correct, right. And there were technologies that we were assessing uh, before COVID hit, um, VPN technologies, for example, mm -hmm. uh, Office 365 uh, implementations that um, mm -hmm. when COVID hit, we really accelerated those okay. um, very quickly um, and made them as tools available to the employees. So I guess you, know, you have those tools in place. Um, does Norwalk have plans to allow employees more flexibility work from home in the future after uh, the pandemic is over? You know, that's really a policy decision from the administration. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, certainly it's been an eye opener in terms of, again, how we reimagine how we deliver services, what mm -hmm. has worked well, uh, what needs to be refined going forward. But I think on a uh, department by department basis. I think those, those department heads are, are getting a really good sense of, hey, you know, you really can't pick up the trash from home. Um, that's got to be done uh, in the office, so to speak. But there are other functions. Um, for example, myself, I find I'm working from home more um, and being a lot more productive working from home than I would be in the office. So it's really on a case by case basis, department by department. Um, it's uh, you need people in the office to collect taxes. Mm -hmm. um, you don't necessarily have to have people coming into the building. We set up a, um, um, a walk up window, if you will, for staff, uh, excuse me, for residents to come and pay their taxes. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of what we've done with City Hall, we've set up an appointment system. So rather than yeah. <clears throat> just show up at City Hall and wait in line, you can now make an appointment online um, and come to City Hall and be served right away as opposed to being uh, having to wait in line. And we find that residents really like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess, final question, um, looking forward, if you were to give uh, people at home advice on what they should be doing about cybersecurity, what would be your one piece of advice for them? Henry, let's start with you. I would say, um, be very cautious of, of phishing and connections to your network. Mm -hmm. um, check those uh, return email addresses to make sure it's really from the person that they say it's Just because it says it's from grandma, it doesn't really mean it's from grandma. It's not just from grandma, but the point is there have been um, people who emulated the uh, Johns Hopkins COVID uh, results mm. and um, access to certain information I think people are preying upon the fear and the fact that people are busy at home and they just don't have the normal controls that we have in an office environment. Mm -hmm. And you have to be just extra cautious. Yeah, like some of the stuff that might've been handled by firewalls at work previously, people are kind of on their own now and have to learn how to be responsible for some of their own sort of security things. Correct, correct. And when the pressure is on to get the work done in a time uh, critical fashion, um, we sometimes forget the, some of those basic security protocols that we normally do. Yeah, Karen? So I would really echo what Henry said. The, uh, the bad actors know that we're distracted as a nation right now mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons. Um, and uh, 
our emotions can run high, whether it's relative to COVID-19 or politics or whatever it happens to be. So you need to be extra vigilant for emails. I would also say that with a lot of people working from home, passwords become difficult to remember. Mm -hmm. um, make, but make your passwords complex. Um, yeah. Make them 12 characters, uh, upper and lower case. Uh, add, you know, pass phrases, if you will, as mm -hmm. opposed to a password. And don't use the same password or similar password between your business and your non-business accounts. Um, mm. We've seen cases where, um, you know, an employee may have um, shot themselves in the foot because they used their Facebook password for their um, their email, pa their work email mm -hmm. password. Um, that's a recipe for disaster. Um, so we would encourage everyone to have a complex password and to have unique passwords even with your personal accounts, um, mm -hmm. it's tough to remember. And if you have to write them down, so be it, but put it in a place where only you know where to get to. Yeah. So it sounds like some of the worry is that people's private lives and the things they're doing on Facebook, social media, on those same computers because they're working at home could get into the work system. So it's not even they were doing something necessarily that didn't make sense with the work system itself, but a computer on the, their own things then leads into them getting into the other stuff because you use the same password, password right. one, two, three, four, or whatever for all of it. And once they got right. that, they say, oh, what else you got on your computer? Oh, you work for Norwalk. Let's get in there. Right. Don't reuse passwords. Don't that's, reuse passwords. That's the rule. That's, that's, the that's, rule. that's, that's, that's your takeaway. Dale, yep. what's your takeaway? Uh, I would uh, suggest that be careful about all of these other uh, devices that uh, are marketed to us by many different vendors. Uh, mm -hmm. Think twice, going back to what uh, Karen said about their, uh, uh, their three levels of evaluation, uh, green, uh, yellow, red. Mm -hmm. uh, anytime they add a new device to the network, that applies whether you're in a city or even in your home, mm -hmm. whether you're adding uh, surveillance cameras or Siri or uh, any of the other products that tout the fact that they can connect to the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that they can connect to the internet means that some hacker can hack into your home or into your office or into your applications. Mm -hmm. So make sure you uh, really vet those devices uh, mm -hmm. before you start using them and putting them on your network. So we're talking about like you know, Alexa's they, they and all that kind of stuff? Under, yeah, they kind of fall under that whole category of IoT, Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we're just seeing a, a flood of those devices, uh, something we've uh, discussed with uh, uh, with Norwalk, uh, things that I've never even thought about. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, what happens if your uh, sprinkler system is connected through an Internet connection? Mm -hmm. Could somebody theoretically hack into your sprinkler system and, and set it off? Yeah. Who knows? Uh, but those are the types of uh, things you need to think about, particularly when you have a, a large and, and complex uh, organization like the city of Norwalk with multiple buildings, mm -hmm. multiple departments. Uh, and as Henry said, a lot of personally identifiable information that uh, could be possibly leaked. So uh, the whole IoT area is right now... Uh, uh, it, it 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 has enlarged that attack surface, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Rather, the, every time you add these new devices, it, it's just another way for the hackers to uh, to possibly penetrate your uh, your security. Those conveniences can make it convenient for the hackers as well. Absolutely. I would add that years ago, I was a consultant to a smaller company, and it was many years ago, and the security of that system was suspect mm -hmm. and I just insisted that our accounting records be on a computer that was not interconnected with the internet or anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, it gave us a level of security against the vulnerability until that vulnerability was shored up and satisfactory. Mm -hmm. So that's part of, it's sort of a doomsday kind of security approach mm -hmm. because you're losing so much utility. Mm -hmm. But if the cybersecurity is so weak, that yeah. is an ultimate way of yeah. sure that you're not as vulnerable as you might be. So maybe not a long-term solution, but in the short term, until you have those more modern security things in place, going old school might be the safest old, way to go. Old school sometimes works. But I think probably as things progress, it's going to be harder and harder <laughs> to actually use those kind of 
legacy products as Dale will call them because the, the support for those things will kind of slowly fade, I think, as everything becomes more and more online. So getting on top of the security now is the way to go. Prevention is worth a thousand times the cure. And that's probably a low ball list. I think that's the, the word all around here. Prevention, prevention, prevention. Uh, well, we could certainly keep talking about IT security all day. And I think we could all get together, you know, six months, a year from now and have an entirely different discussion with all new factors to talk about, which, you know, maybe we should do here from now. So thank you all for talking with us. It sounds like Norwalk is in good hands and uh, take care and stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. To thank our guests. And on a special note, this episode marks the second year of the Missile Voice. So I'd like to make a special thanks to our premier sponsors, Digital Back Office, Palo Alto Networks, who you can check out at digitalbackoffice.com and paloaltonetworks.com, as well as our sponsors, Gateway Community College and Housatonic Community College. Learn more at gatewayct.edu and housatonic.edu. Thanks to CCM staff and an extra special thanks to Paul Bass and Harry Drods for keeping this show in the air through uncertain times. Make sure you support the New Haven Independent at WNHH where you can. The Municipal Voice is a co-production by CCM and WNHH 103.5 FM. Kevin Maloney is our executive producer. Christopher Gilson is our producer. Harry Draws is on the boards. And I'm Matt Ford, your host. Be sure to check out our Facebook page and give us a like. And watch out for our CCM chat series on our YouTube page. Over the spring and summer, America was confronted once again by the ugly truth that systemic racism persists throughout our society. The effects of systemic racism have consequences in housing, education, health, wealth, and nearly every other part of daily life. In fact, race is still the number one predictor of success and well-being in our country. The Connecticut Conference of Municipalities is hosting a series of online discussions called CCM Cares, Getting Comfortable with the Uncomfortable. You, the community, are a critical part of this equation, and we want you to be there for one of our four 90-minute panel discussions with community and municipal leaders. Learn more at ccmcares.com.